right, here we are. Welcome to Nehije, our Voices Indigenous Solutions podcast. This is your host, Lila June. Yat eh, shik eh, auto shitane. Greetings, my relatives, my people everywhere. We're really honored to be joined today by Sherry Mitchell of the Penobscot Nation. And today we're going to talk about lateral kindness and the ways in which this technology, if you will, can spark so much healing and beauty in our communities. And Sherry's been looking at this for a long time. So we're very excited to dig into the topic. Thank you for being here, Sherry. And would you like to honor your ancestors by introducing yourself a little bit before we begin? I would. Thank you so much, uh, Kachi Willi Wanlila, for, for having me with you. And Deli Wisi Wanahomu Kwaset and Ajeo Benwapskewi. And Del Nabama Kawasu Snold Wanoroskewi, Nagakaka Gus Nolti Bayek. I'm from the Penobscot Nation, as you said, and my family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe at Tibayak. So thank you. Amazing. And where is Penobscot Nation? Where is your traditional homeland? So we are in uh, Chwabanakieg. Uh, Chwabanakieg territory it runs um, up into the Canadian Maritimes and down into the northeastern United States. So um Penobscot Nation or Bunawabskewi is uh, in central Maine. And the majority of our communities are across the border uh, in Canada. There are only five Wabanaki communities in um, remaining on this side of the border. Uh, uh, Penobscot Nation, which is where I grew up, um, two Passamaquoddy um, tribes, one in uh, Madakmikuk, which is in the inland freshwater uh, area, and then the saltwater, um, Passamaquoddy, Adzibayak, which is where my grandmother is from. And um, then there's a Mi'kmaq and uh, Wallista community up right on the Canadian border. And so the the majority of the Wabanaki people are still in Canada, um, and the border kind of bisected our lands and cut us off from the rest of our relatives, um, which is something that we've noticed far more um deeply as a result of COVID. So, but that's a, that's a whole other conversation. Yes. There's many conversations we could have uh, that are all very important. Um, So to get started, uh, what does lateral kindness mean to you and how did you get started uh, in this work? Yeah, this is, this is something that I um, had seen somewhere else. It's certainly not a, a term that I coined. I had the fortune of coming across this terminology and thinking about it from a traditional perspective uh, a few years ago, uh, after I had been working for quite some time on really looking at healing trauma. Uh, We have so many um, behaviors and characteristics and habits, traditions that we've developed based on our traumatic history. And I uh, have invested a lot of time in trying to explore ways for us to uh, move ourselves away from the trauma that we have been carrying for so long. One of the things that I found in doing that was this work on lateral kindness, which is shifting us away from behaving in divisive ways that are born of colonization and moving us back toward traditional uh, cultural ways of being in relationship with one another. It's very kin centric. And so when we're thinking about lateral kindness, we're thinking about taking care of our relatives and being good relatives. And um, there's a lot of terminology in our language that's connected to this, you know, Basilda and Dilnabamuk, like uh, just the recognition that we're related to, to all life and, um, thinking of these these things that I've talked about and written about quite extensively, like Alabizu and Mama Bizu, which is this universal sense of enough, communal sense of enough, and then an individual sense of enough, uh, and how those are based on our care for one another, that I can never truly have enough if everybody doesn't have enough, because part of my well-being is my responsibility towards caring for my relatives. 
And so this, this concept of lateral kindness is really in alignment with our traditional ways of being as uh, Skishinawak peoples or as Indigenous peoples. And it's in alignment with our traditional ways of knowing. And, you know, as we're coming to know ourselves outside of the ways that we've been defined by others, um, we're coming back more and more to our own traditional ways of being and um, honoring our traditional ways of knowing. It feels really important for us to recognize that uh, our people are inherently kind. They're inherently caring that we have built into our traditional ways of being this model of caregiving that is out of alignment in a lot of ways with, with some of the ways that we've been uh, behaving towards one another. And I think that it's critical for us to start moving back towards those ways of being um, that guide us uh, towards our, our goodness, our essential goodness. And so that the first time I saw this work on lateral kindness, it really spoke to me in that way. Um, so. Right, right. And you were saying you noticed how a lot of our forward momentum was being stifled by our division and that kind of inspired you to to start on this work yeah i think that it's um i think it's apparent to anybody that is doing work uh out in the world today whether it be in indigenous communities or elsewhere um that there is a barrier that's created as a result of this this belief in scarcity and this belief in othering where we feel like there's some need for us to place ourselves above others in some way, where um, there's some need for us to elevate ourselves at the expense of other people. Uh, and that's really at the heart of lateral violence is this, this belief in separation. Um, and so when we're trying to do work in any of our communities, um, I mean, this is my experience and having worked with a lot of tribal people across Turtle Island, uh, I believe that it's the experience of, of a number of other Native communities that this intrusion of lateral violence into our communities has made it nearly impossible for us to unify around the things that we care about the most. Um, it prevents us from hearing all of the voices, right? We're people of the circle. We became people of the circle because people learned over time, our ancestors learned the benefit of seeing things from every different side, from hearing uh, the perspectives of all those around the circle so that we can have a holistic view of things. And we've lost that way of thinking uh, to colonization. And we began thinking in terms of hierarchy. And when you're thinking about things in terms of hierarchy, you oftentimes, you know, as you're elevating up through that ladder, you stop seeing what's going on on the ground, but you also can't see fully what's behind you or what's to the side of you on either side in the elevated status without toppling. Uh, in some ways. And so there's a real, even though you you think that you have this elevation that's moving you up the ladder, uh, your view is getting narrower and narrower as you're going because you're failing to uh, take the benefit of all of these different perspectives and moving decision-making to the hands of very few who oftentimes are, are territorial about what it is that they know and are not sharing information with the rest of the people or getting information from the rest of the people mm -hmm. in order to have a full view of, of what's being seen. And so uh, when we adopted those models, those hierarchical models, um, and began thinking about elevating ourselves rather than lifting up the whole of our communities, uh, we lost a lot of our vision. And so lateral kindness is also a way to get us back into, uh, you know, what one of our elders um, talks about in this full-bodied seeing is uh, he talks about like the world we're living in today. Uh, Albert Marshall talks about two-eyed seeing. Um, and he's talking about a Western lens and an indigenous lens and, and being able to look through those without losing your indigeneity and figuring out how do you function in the world holistically um, today. And, um, you know, we need to be doing that in relation to all of the decisions that we're making because we're you know, we're navigating collapse, right? We're, um, we're in this process of watching these, these old systems of domination 
slowly begin to crumble. The foundations of them are are becoming weaker and weaker all the time. And uh, we have to learn how to live outside of those towers and back on the ground again. And how do we learn to live, uh, you know, back on the ground again in connection to uh, our own ways of being and ways of knowing. And that starts with how we care for one another. And that's connected to these notions of lateral kindness. Thank you. And for those who may not have heard of lateral kindness or lateral violence, it's usually applied to situations where Indigenous peoples are not just being oppressed by colonial forces or mainstream society. They're also being um, oppressed. They're oppressing. We're oppressing each other laterally, like side to side by basically stopping each other from from succeeding or what have you all and which sherry in a little bit is going to talk about is not even our fault that we're doing this it's not from us um but yeah just to contextualize the conversation a little bit and we're really excited here to be listening to sherry uh, and i want to read her bio just a little bit before we go to the the next question uh sherry mitchell is an indigenous attorney activist and author from the penobscot nation she is a graduate of the University of Arizona's Rogers College of Law, specializing in Indigenous peoples law and policy. She's also an alumna of the American Indian Ambassador Program and the Udall Native American Congressional Internship Program. Sherry is the author of an award-winning book, Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change. She's also a contributor to 11 anthologies, including the bestseller, all We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis, and Resetting Our Future, Empowering Climate Action in the United States. Uh, Sherry is also the founding director of the Land Peace Foundation, an organization dedicated to the preservation of Indigenous rights and the protection of the Indigenous way of life. Um, she serves as a trustee for the American Indian Institute as an advisory council member uh, or rather, and as an advisory council member for Nia Taro's Indigenous Land Guardianship Program, and as a board member for the Post Carbon Institute. Uh, Sherry was a member in the development team for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, uh, Action for Climate Empowerment, providing education, engagement, training, and workforce development for climate action in the United States, and <laughs> Sherry is also a convener of the global healing ceremony called Healing the Wounds of Turtle Island, a gathering that has brought more than 50,000 people together from six continents to focus on healing our relationships with one another and the natural world. She speaks and teaches around the world on issues of indigenous rights, climate change, and transformational socio-spiritual change. So there you go, socio-spiritual change. Um, so obviously we're incredibly honored to have you here, Sherry, uh, and I really appreciate you letting us also share with the listeners a little bit more about your work in the world. So getting back to this topic of lateral kindness and lateral violence, uh, what is lateral violence and how do you feel it is ended up in our communities today? You know, I think that this is a really important question because most people have experienced lateral violence. Some people know the terminology and are able to recognize and, and identify and name it when it comes up. Um, and when we're, when we're looking at um, lateral violence uh, in terms of um, our own experiences as Indigenous peoples, it's essentially the process um, of those who have been oppressed for long periods of time um, beginning to oppress their own people. And so when you have an oppressed population that has been made to feel powerless for long periods of time, one of the things that they do in order to exert some sense of power uh, is to use the same oppressive tactics that have been used against them on their own people. Um, and we call that lateral violence. Also, when we're thinking about lateral violence, we also have to think about um, people who are trying to protect one another. Um, and so sometimes lateral violence is um, 
shows up uh, in the form of a distortion of care. And so uh, one of the things that I noted years ago uh, in regard to um, the way that young women were taught about their bodies um, outside of traditional uh, ways of, of teaching and ceremony and rites of passage, the things that came up to replace those natural rites of passage were shaming um, and uh, oftentimes a condemnation and a ridicule. Um, and I, you know, I first saw this when I, I started to travel, I was in my twenties. The first time I, I started to travel, um, outside of Wabanaki territory to other tribal communities. Um, and I, uh, I noticed that no matter where I went, um, from the West coast, all the way up into Northern Canada, that if you went to the local swimming hole, where there were kids swimming, uh, you would see most of the young women would be wearing t-shirts that went all the way down to their knees over their bathing suits. Uh, they had been taught, you know, to cover their bodies. And when we think about where this came from, you know, that originally rose up as a form of protection because um, there was a, you know, a real effort uh, to commodify the bodies of indigenous women. And um, there was a lot of sexual violence that was imposed upon Indigenous women and then continues to be imposed upon Indigenous women. And that the ways that those young women are being protected from that is a distortion of the type of care that they really need um, because they're being told to cover up, they're being shamed for their own development and um, made to feel like there's something um, dirty or shameful in their developing body. Uh, and that is a form of lateral violence that arose as a result of an effort toward protection and care in a time that was chaotic and uh, where people felt powerless to actually um, be able to enact any type of protocols that would result in real protection for um, for their daughters. Uh, and so when we think about the history of, of how lateral violence cropped up um, and we start to investigate it and, and really explore how it's manifested in our communities, what we often can see is we can see those elements of uh, a loved base intention underlying the meanness that really is at the core of uh, some of these these uh, contemporary expressions of lateral violence. And so most of those things are the result of uh, oppression, violence, and um, degradation of our, our bodies, our beings, and our ways of being um, that have resulted uh, through colonization and the process of the unsettling of Turtle Island. Right, and just to continue on this question a little bit, um, I was in France recently for a, basically a big festival about um, America, and they had like a whole component on Indigenous Americans, aka you know, Turtle Island, Turtle Islanders, uh, <laughs> and um, there was all these pictures of Pine Ridge, you know, that was like you know, kind of almost romanticizing the poverty, romanticizing the, the grit that people had to have, have to have to live there. And my friend who's Oglala, she was like, I don't know why they're showing these pictures. She's like, this isn't even us. These pictures are actually more a picture of the cruelty of colonization than they are a picture of us. And so when you and me were talking earlier about, you know, how lateral violence we need to dislocate it from our bodies, meaning be like, be like, this isn't from us. You know, this isn't even our problem. <laughs> this is actually the problem of colonization of, of the oppressors reflected in our bodies, but it's not, it's not us. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by uh, relocating lateral violence and, you know, how it relates to us and how it doesn't at all. That's a really great question. I think one of the challenges that we have in this process of uh, returning ourselves to a state of wholeness is we embodied some of the 
symptoms and some of the harms that have resulted from the long-term wounding of our of our people. And uh, we have judged ourselves on that. We have punished ourselves as a result of having those thoughts and those behaviors. In order for us to heal from those types of things, we have to first recognize that it's not ours, that this isn't our way of being. This isn't our way of knowing. This isn't the way that we have chosen to be in relationship with one another. This is the result of impositions of violence and injustice and inequity. When you look at Indigenous peoples, we're, we're kind of on the bottom of this hierarchy that's been created here, this false hierarchy of power, where um, there's uh, all others who are here on our homelands have in some way had to step up upon us in order to elevate themselves. And so when we think about all of the feet that have been on our backs over all of that time and all of the ways that we have had to contort ourselves to adapt in order to survive, uh, we can start to develop some real compassion for um, what we've gone through and start to have some real understanding that we're, we're carrying this cumulative emotional and spiritual wound um, as a result of the history of violence that we all share. And when we start to think about how we're going to be able to find our own sense of power, and we've been separated from our, our own ways of knowing, um, we start to model and mimic the behaviors of those who have kept us suppressed. There is this quote by Maya Angelou, and I, you know, I think we have so many commonalities with people from the Black population in regard to the oppression, because we are also pitted against each other for, you know, this lower rung, and we're the two populations of people who have really been displaced from our land. And, and I, I really resonated with this as a young girl hearing this quote that I did the best I could, or the best I knew how to do. And then when I knew better, I did better. And I think that we need to give ourselves that kind of compassion um, as Indigenous people to recognize that we've been doing the best we can just to survive under centuries of unrelenting violence against us that continues to this day. And that in the process of that fight for survival, there are some things that fell to the wayside that we need to pick back up. Uh, there are some things that some habits that we developed in this process of survival that will not serve us as we move toward, you know, living fully embodied in the future. When I think about the, um, the amount of lateral violence that exists and the ways that, um, that we have begun to harm and put down and diminish our own people as a result of colonization and these patriarchal methods of governing and developing the society. Um, when I think about uh, all of the beauty that exists within our ways of knowing, um, in our ways of being, you'll never hear in a traditional ceremony, somebody talking about, you know, you need to, to step on this other person to elevate yourself. You'll never hear a traditional Indigenous elder uh, talking about, uh, you know, cutthroat dog-eat-dog -dog ways of getting ahead. Um, none of those things are part of our way of being. Uh, they're not part of our way of knowing. And so when we can separate ourselves from those things and recognize that, um, you know, that path, that path of violence that was imposed upon our people, that path of violence that allows some to elevate themselves over others at the expense of that other's life, um, that that's not the path that we want to be walking. And when we make a commitment to going back to what we call Skajinawe Bamosawagan, this traditional way of being uh, in the world, then we recognize that the first step upon that path, that red road, is for us to uh, remember our obligation to our relatives, recognize all of the harm that's been done to everyone along the way, 
learn to acknowledge that people have really been harmed and are carrying deep pain and wounds from those harms and that they deserve to be treated with a little bit of gentleness. Um, and I sometimes think that the ways that we're really harsh on each other and really critical with one another are also part of the expression of care that we have because you know we've had to be exceptional in order to find any kind of success within this colonial world. This whole concept of lateral violence is so invasive. It has so many different toxic behaviors that are associated um, with it. You know, some of them are conscious, deliberate acts of meanness with the intention to harm uh, or to create fear in someone because you, you know, you feel powerful in some way, but also you don't want anyone looking too closely at you. So if you keep them away, then they're not going to look too closely at you because we're hypercritical of one another. Other forms of lateral violence may not be things that are done intentionally. They may just be learned behaviors that we've that we've picked up over time. If we can move those things away from ourselves, we can, you know, kind of pick it up and, and look at the behavior, take it outside of our body, then we're not so self-identified with it. Because one of the saddest things that I've seen in, in some of the work that I've done is this notion of toughness being associated with meanness, with meanness being a reflection of strength with detachment from your own sense of a uh, you know emotional well-being your own sense of of knowing your own emotional state and your own spiritual state having that shut down has been has been promoted as a sign of strength amongst a lot of young people i really feel like there are some incredible gifts that have come in with us uh in in for us as a as a species, uh, and specifically as indigenous people, there are some people that are being born with some incredible gifts within this younger generation. And they're having to move through all of this false information about who they are and what strength means and, and get back to a place of finding the beauty within themselves in order to really cultivate and nurture the gift that lives within them. Um, and so it's not just about blocking one another on the path, the adoption of lateral violence against ourselves, where we judge and condemn and prevent ourselves from fully feeling and, and showing up with all of our intuition intact, right? Our sense of inner knowing can't be fully developed if we're blocked emotionally, that that's another way that we prevent ourselves from moving forward as a result of, of um, this violence, because it's not just aimed at others. We also aim it at ourselves and we critique ourselves because that's what we've learned uh, to do. And we've learned to align ourselves with these different things that we think represent strength that actually weaken us. And so this work of lateral kindness is about leaving those colonial trappings behind. Our people are not mean-spirited. Uh, you know, Indigenous people are caring people. Indigenous people are strong people. Uh, and we're strong because we lift one another up, that we support one another, we support one another's gifts. And so there's too much of this condemnation of one another and attacking one another, where, you know, you feel like you have to bring someone else down in order to make yourself seem worthy in some way that that um, that whole notion is based on ideas of conquest that are connected to the Church of Rome and to wars of conquest, uh, these holy wars, and to witch hunts and all of these other things that are just these horrific displays throughout history. They're not anything that we need to carry with us into the future as Indigenous peoples. Thank you so much for all of this. And also thank you for discerning between those types of lateral violence that are intentional and those types that are not, those types that are just moving through us unconsciously. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of people listening who are listening very intently because this is not a joke. You know, this has caused extreme harm that takes, you know, sometimes years to, to, to heal, you know, and to unlearn yeah. everything from the way we treat each other and Obviously, we can't ignore the familial lateral violence, the ways in which uh, things are passed through the family. Um, thinking about the, the boarding schools in Canada, they have some crazy statistic, you know, that, that 
a, a large percentage of kids in the Canadian boarding schools were subjected to sexual abuse. And then so when you're a kid, you have no other choice really but to turn it into love, you know, because that's how you survive it. Oh, they're doing this to me because they love me. They're doing this to me because they're giving me attention or, you know, there's all kinds of creative ways that we as children transform something violent into something beautiful just to survive it, you know, because if you're a six-year-old kid in a boarding school, you're not getting out till you're 18. You know, if when you were six years old, 18 felt like an eternity away. So you better find a way to make your present situation beautiful or somehow uh, endurable by creating these creative rose tintings of the situation. But then the issue is once you get older, if you don't correct that rose tint, if you don't take those glass rose tinted glasses off and see it for what it is of like, oh, no, this person didn't care about this was not caring behavior. This was molestation or this was uh, verbal abuse or this was ostracization or whatever. Uh, then you're liable to pass that on to your kids, right? Because if you've accepted this lie that this abuse equals love, then when you have kids and you love them, then you're going to quote unquote love them the way you've decided love is expressed, which is often expressed in, in abusive ways. So, and then that's, that's a hard one too. The familial one, right? Is like when your own family hurts you, it's, it's a deeper, um, deeper need to turn it into love and it goes on and I, I there's one cycle in my family which I won't go into detail with but it's the fifth generation now is experiencing and I've watched it I've tracked it five generations this abusive behavior has occurred and I think to myself wow this thing can really travel far down the line um but in any case, I really appreciate you discerning between, you know, that which is conscious or at least somewhat intentional and that which is just trying to love each other in these very, um, like you said, distorted ways. But um, I think some of us decide, you know, the buck stops here. I'm going to take these glasses off. I'm going to look at this for what it is. And ooh, that's not fun. But at least that that temporary pain of me really realizing that this is not love is going to the reward is that it will never go on in the future ever again uh, through my line you know and so it's very exciting when people have the courage to take those rose scented glasses off and it's very understandable when people can't because sometimes it's just too much to look at um but let's move on to another question here um going back to lateral kindness you know what are some examples of you know, spontaneous lateral kindness you've seen in our communities that are just kind of people naturally going back to our traditional ways. Have you seen any examples of this or does that question spark any thoughts for you? I would like to have an opportunity to just follow up what you just said for just maybe like two minutes. Yeah, of course, of course. So if we if we think about this issue of lateral violence, I think this is where it becomes really important for us to educate people within our communities and to help them understand the way that trauma works and how it impacts us. One of the things that that we see oftentimes, you know, when you're talking about it's so difficult to break these cycles, and it's not just because there's so much pain, but because there's so much love for those who have come before us as well. And we have this loyalty to our ancestors, but also to our elders. Um, and it's hard for us to break cycles within generations where the elders who perpetuated those cycles still live. And so when, we, when we're when we thinking about um, all of this, we have to figure out how do we do, do this in a way that tells them how you were treated is not okay too, not just how you're treating others. Um, and how do we look at this in terms of understanding trauma that there's, you know, this emotional loop where emotions rise and then they naturally are allowed to fall. But when you're uh, in in situations of trauma, our three core needs of safety, belonging and dignity, um, which are constitutive or inherent, get 
distorted because those loops are not allowed to close properly where we are able to um, maintain our sense of safety, belonging, and dignity, which are the three things that were systematically attacked during colonization was our sense of safety, our sense of belonging to our communities, and our sense of dignity. You know, we were dehumanized, we were separated from one another, and our communities and our bodies were attacked. And so when we think about um, these movements traveling along a loop from beginning to completion, um, and us not having the ability to do that and having to make alternative moves to protect ourselves or one of our core needs, um, that that comes out in the distortion of behavior that gets lodged in our body. And, you know, our body, our mind, our spirits, our emotional bodies are all impacted by that. And so I, I really think that it's important to understand that compassion is really the key to um, ending lateral violence and moving us back towards lateral kindness, which there are countless expressions of already in our communities that have survived despite all of these. Um, so it's not like we have to recreate things. We just have to reinforce and uplift and support things that we already do. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And have you seen some examples of that in our communities? Yeah, I I cite these examples of what I, you know, have seen growing up and and the things that still happen in our community. So when we look at potluck or potlatch ceremonies that people have in their communities when somebody's having a hard time. When we were growing up, we used to uh, my grandparents always talked about pound parties and oh, we need to give this person a pound party. Um, and what that meant was that they would go to everybody in the community and everybody would contribute a pound of something, uh, a pound of flour, a pound of sugar, a pound of oats, a pound of rice, uh, a pound of beans, something that, uh, you know, would help to support this family um, who was going through a difficult time. And, and we do those things as Indigenous peoples. We help one another out. You know, we can be yelling at somebody in the street one day, and then we hear that they've gotten into a car accident, and then we're the one who's leading the, you know, the fundraiser for them and, and organizing the cooking of meals for their families while they're getting better. Because, you know, in our hearts, we really do care about one another. And I think that, you know, we have so many examples of that. And one of the things that I think it's really fun for people to do is to, to sit down together as a group and name all the ways that we already are engaging in lateral kindness. Um, how do we support one another with, you know, community gardens, the, you know, your, uh, your work and your brilliant um, dissertation um, and, uh, looking at all ways that we have devised systems that not only help and support one another, but also honor our relationships with the rest of creation. Um, look at all the ways that we're already engaged in living in an honorable way, even, even when it distorted, right? How do we recognize mm. that the shaming of young girls' bodies has resulted from this distortion of love. And how can we think about ways to demonstrate that in more healthy ways together? Um, but also, can we have a moment of grieving for all of those mothers and grandmothers who felt inclined to do that, who were compelled to behave in those ways because they were so terrified that their girl was going to be the one taken or their girl was going to be the one harmed? Can we start to look at those children who were harmed that grew up to harm others and start finding our compassion and then talk about those things as we're imagining together. Um, what ways are we already behaving that could be a balm or healing for that particular thing? Um, and I don't think that we have to look very far. We feed one another. We care for one another when we're sick. Um, you know, there's all, all kinds of things that are actually um, integrated and woven into our traditional ways of being that are part of this. I've seen the, the best expressions of that in my own life through my grandparents, but also through other ceremonial people who I had the incredible honor of having in my life, um, who show this kind of selfless generosity of spirit. When somebody is in need of something, we find ways to make sure that they get what they need. 
Um, and I, I think one of the things that is most beautiful to me is that the reality is, I think that if we think about it, we all can think about, you know, two people who are arguing in the street one day or on Facebook and, and then that person gets hurt and they really want to make sure that they're okay. So they can argue with them another day, you know, because in our hearts, we really do care about, we really do care about one another and how can we start looking at and laughing at in some ways or crying for the ways that we've distorted those acts of caring and how can we shift them back towards more healthy ways of being in relationship with one another? Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate all the time you've taken to look at this topic in depth and the ways you've probably looked at it from so many angles and turned it inside out with different community members. So I'm just honored to mm -hmm. share this with people today. Um, so uh, moving from, you know, just the things we naturally do to, to create lateral kindness in our communities, uh, which I agree is, is compassion. You know, I think it's, I've definitely seen like even even reservation dogs right like that movie uh mm -hmm. they call like the kids call each other the b word right that's this like normalized lateral violence and i remember growing up in on the res in in northern new mexico and like that's how it was you know and it but it wasn't seen as a bad thing it was seen as like i don't even know what it was it was like this endearing way of of te of being mean to each other as a way of showing our love it was very abusive but very loving at the same time it's very strange but what I've noticed is that like as I've grown older expressing kindness and uplifting others in our communities is so fun because people are almost shocked sometimes they're like whoa you're not scared of me I'm like no I'm definitely not scared of you I think you're amazing you know uh it's this shock but it's also so natural, too, because I've noticed that my my circle of the people around me, when I do express that love, it's like they just step right into it because there is this part of us, no matter how much we've been conditioned into lateral violence, that love is going to always feel good and it's going to always make sense. And it's always part of our internal compass. And so no matter how far we've strayed from that path, when someone just introduces it, there's an immediate uh, familiarity to it, like an immediate gratitude for it, an immediate reaction to it of like, oh yeah. And like, hey, this is this is kind of nice, you know. <laughs> and I think those little sparks that we plant can be so exponentially growing because all people really need is one moment. You know, they just need one moment of feeling what we're meant to feel. And then from there, it gives them like a something to compare things to of like, oh, oh, Lila said that I was amazing and beautiful. Oh, why, why, wait, that means why didn't others tell me that growing up? You know, <laughs> and it sort of kicks off this whole series of dominoes of sifting through memories. And I think just however hard Coyote has worked to destroy our communities, just one moment of compassion can unravel that whole thing. And that just speaks to the power of compassion versus um, versus negativity, that it just takes one little moment, one little word, one little exchange to sort of start getting people thinking and getting people healing on a healing path. Um, but anyway, so you've done a lot of efforts, you know, at, at, in various groups you've worked in and community projects. Uh, have you seen any success stories with the efforts you and your groups have been working on? Um, or more intentionally? Absolutely. I started out quite a few years ago working with younger generation people when I was very young because we didn't have really good mentors in our community when I was growing up. We had a lot of great people, but we didn't have people who were really trying to nurture um, nurture our hearts and our minds in a good way. And so taking the time to be with and to provide guidance for the young people is where I've seen some of the greatest reward um, and success stories. When there is an investment in our youth, I remember one time, um, you know, one young woman who was adamant about becoming a doctor and she won an educational award and invited me to be part of the ceremony of honoring her as a as a teacher, um, 
because, you know, 20 years ago, I said to her, you know, I've noticed the way that you have this beautiful way of talking to the people who are younger than you, because she was naturally a leader. I wanted to cultivate her using her powers for good, um, that you have this way of talking to young people and, and how they look up to you and that what you have to say and what you teach them really matters and is going to make a huge difference. And it was just that little thing to get her thinking about how she used her power of persuasion amongst those who are younger than her, because uh, it wasn't always being used in a, in a positive way at that time. And 20 years later, she you know said, this changed my life. This shifted something in me that allowed me to see that I had an ability to influence people in a really positive way. And um, we have uh, instituted a very quiet program here, probably will be very quiet after the show, but of really uplifting single mothers, young single native mothers, and helping them to see the beauty in their role as the caregivers of our future leaders and uh, really honoring them, really uplifting them, giving them opportunities to enjoy moments with their children where there would have otherwise been stress if we weren't there to help them um, to relieve some of the pressure at some of these pressure moments um, that they experience and um, being able to help them and honor them and uplift them and tell them about the importance of the role that they're carrying um, actually not only has helped those mothers, but it has helped their children in ways that we haven't even begun to recognize yet. And so the little ways that we can speak power um, into people's hearts that is based in the beauty of our ways of of seeing and knowing and being, then the more we're going to see the results of that. We're seeing young women who have been in active addiction and have worked through recovery and who have been supported through that entire process become really loving, engaged, and involved mothers. Um, We're initiating programs uh, across Wabanaki territory. There's a number of organizations initiating programs Um, food sovereignty programs where we're actively feeding one another again and caring for one another in ways that um, we have farmed out, you know, just to to coin a phrase, like, you know, we farmed out our care for one another in so many ways, whether it's to social services or to, uh, you know, colonial education systems or um, a medical industry that doesn't always uh, or hardly ever cares truly for the individual. Um, We farmed out that care in ways that have prevented us from even knowing how to care for our own bodies. And so, teaching one another how to be in relationship with the land again has resulted in this building of kinship amongst different organizations and different groups that um, of people who normally would have been in competition with one another. Uh, so all of those types of things where we can, you know, really demonstrate our care for one another. Uh, and it doesn't matter what we're doing. If we're teaching somebody the language, if we're teaching somebody how to plant, if we're, uh, you know, if we're uplifting and sharing our stories of overcoming challenges with other young single mothers, if we're, you know, um, helping somebody to believe in the gifts that they carry that they may not be aware of, all of those different things that we that we can do to uplift one another. If we can just find one thing every day that we could do, like I'm going to speak some good into the world every single day or, or um, you know, take some action every single day that's going to bring some of the goodness of of my ancestors, because we're so we become so attached to our ancestral uh, trauma. And, you know, now let's, let's shift that and become attached to our ancestral goodness, the kindness in our clan mothers and grandmothers. They were strong, but they, you know, they held us close to their hearts. And we need to start exhibiting some of that kindness and that care for one another back out into our communities in ways that are going to start shifting some of the the walls that have been built around us to protect us from all of the harm uh, so that we can once again start to open our hearts to one another and to creating a path forward for our future generations that's based in you know loving caring ways of being rather than just in base survival uh, and adopting these colonial characteristics that are suffocating the life out of our ways of being. 
indigenous peoples are kind, indigenous peoples are loving, indigenous peoples are uplifting of one another. I think that's how you started this uh, this discussion. And I just want to lift those words up again, that that's who we are. And and that mm -hmm. kindness is traditional, you know, uh, is a really cool thought. You know, that's what one of our late uh, Hatasis, our late um, medicine men always said. Uh, he said, if someone walks around the Hogan counterclockwise, don't scream at them. Don't yell at them. Be gentle. Say, Shiyaji, which means like my little beloved child you're going the wrong way go around this way okay and he said be gentle about it he said those people who get after them and say hey what are you he said that's the boarding school talking he said that's not us um and i just thought that was pretty beautiful how he said that because he had been to the boarding schools himself he had he had been through everything a native man could go through um and, uh, you know, that's to me, he was a, a, tr a quote unquote true elder because he had that softness of his heart. Um, and I just see that in so many people. And um, and and but this is not to in any way, shape or form be belittle folks who, who don't have that, because to your point, really, all we should have is compassion there, because there's a reason why <laughs> there's a reason why people are prickly. There's a really good reason why people are angry and, and abusive. And it's usually because they're in a lot of pain. And to, to be gentle with ourselves when we do that to others as well, you know, uh, and to, to be compassionate and understanding. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to say to end this incredible discussion? You know, thank you for your time. It really means a lot to me and a lot of us to even just this word lateral kindness is such an enabling catalyst word to be like, oh, wow, this is a practice. Let me get practicing on it, you know? And so, yeah, is there anything lastly you'd like to share on this topic of lateral kindness? I just want to share a little story. Um, you know, we have uh, this word in our language, uh, misun, which means my heart. Um, and then the word for grandfather is misun. And um, that name for grandfather is a derivative of the name for heart. Uh, and it's a recognition of this, uh, masculine energy softening over time enough to allow space for that feminine nurturing caregiving energy to come in. And so if we think about this move to lateral kindness as our preparation for being the ancestors of our future generations, that softening in our heart, that opening of our heart space um, is going to qualify us because that's that recognition in um, a small is that this, this um, person has had enough softening of their heart to take on the role of the grandfather, um, you know, and so if we're going to be good grandmothers and grandfathers for our future generations, this softening of the heart is an essential part of that process. So, Wow. <laughs> There's been a number of times I've been moved to tears during this conversation, and that was one of them. So thank you. Thank you, Sherry, so much for your time. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks to all of our listeners. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, what, where can people um, learn more about your work, if you don't mind, Sherry? Uh, we have uh, the Land Peace Foundation, which is the organization um, that I run uh, we have a website land peace and it's p-e-a-c-e -E, uh, foundation.org where they can find information on us um, i have a personal author's web page that's currently being updated right now um, that is sacredinstructions.life um, and there's also a public Facebook page that the Land Peace Foundation has. And I also have a public Facebook page. Um, and the my public Facebook page is facebook.com slash sacred instructions. So those are those are two ways to keep in touch with me and with the work that I'm doing. Awesome. Thank you so much for everything. And thank you to all our listeners. And we hope you all have a beautiful day. Ejeja and Sago.